Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest Sporties webinar. We're glad you could join us tonight, where we'll be talking about ADSB, a pilot's guide. We're going to talk about all aspects of this complicated and uh, and changing subject. Uh, it's a it's a subject that is changing our panel avionics, our portable avionics. Uh, it has all kinds of impl implications for pilots, whether uh, you're a new pilot or an experienced pro. Uh, so we're going to get started tonight and, and talk about what ADSB really means, not from a technical standpoint so much as from a from a pilot standpoint. We're glad you could join us tonight uh, on this latest Sporties webinar. My name is John Zimmerman. I'll be one of your presenters tonight. Uh, I work at Sporties Pilot Shop, which is pictured right there. Uh, one of the best jobs in the world because I get to work on the airport every day. Uh, I work on product development and marketing there at Sporties, but tonight I really come to you as an active GA pilot. I fly a variety of aircraft uh, from tail draggers to helicopters, and so I want to share my perspective as a pilot who's been flying with ADSB for the last five years. Um, I'm honored to be joined tonight by Jeff Johnson from Apario. Jeff is also an active pilot, uh, owns a Mooney, uh, has been flying with ADSB again for years. So um, both of us come to this with, with business roles uh, involved in ADSB and products, but I think both of us really more tonight talking as active pilots who, like you, are out there flying with this equipment. I want to give you a quick overview of the presentation tonight. As I said, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to start out with a quick look at what ADSB really is all about. Uh, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot these days, but I think it's important to step back and understand really what it is and maybe as importantly what it is not. Then we'll talk about some key terms. We'll try to demystify some of the jargon that's out there around ADSB because there's an awful lot of acronyms and jargon for sure. We'll talk about how it works, uh, both the weather and the traffic side the ground stations. Then we'll look at it in action. We'll, we'll see what ADSB really means in the cockpit. So we'll look at panel mount avionics and we'll look at portable receivers. And finally, we'll close with some tips and advice for flying with ADSB. A couple of quick housekeeping uh, notes tonight. This webinar will be recorded. So if you have to step away for a minute, uh, you'll uh, be rest assured to know that you'll be able to see this webinar as a complete recording in a couple of days. You'll see that at sporties.com slash webinars. Um, if you have a question, feel free to enter that into the GoToWebinar con uh, control panel you see on your screen. Be happy to take some time at the end of this presentation and answer some questions. So without further ado, we're going to dive in. Um, but before we get going, I want to give you one last cheat uh, or reference, and that is iPad Pilot News. That's a website that I work on uh, with some colleagues at Sporties. It's free. Um, and while it's focused on the iPad, there's actually a lot of uh, ADSB information there as well. Articles, some, uh, some tips. Uh, we'll have a recording of this webinar up there. So if you haven't checked out iPad Pilot News, take a look at that. You may find some good information about ADSB. As we get started tonight, I want to start with a quick poll and get a, get a sense of where everybody is with ADSB. So take just a second on that poll on screen and let us know what your current status is with ADSB. Are you flying with a portable receiver maybe? Uh, are you flying with panel mount avionics, uh, say an ADSB out transponder? Are you flying with both or are you flying with neither? You have no ADSB of any kind and are, are just getting interested. So take a second, click on one of those choices on the screen. <clears throat> and as the results come in here, looks like the majority of people tonight are not flying with any type of ADSB. Um, and then second would be portable receiver only. Got a few folks who are flying with panel mount and a few that are flying with both. Um, I think we'll have information for all of you tonight. Hopefully everybody, regardless of where you are, uh, comes away with something. Um, and, uh, and certainly for those who are new in the ADSB world, I think you'll have a lot, uh, lot of information out of this. So with that said, we're going to dive right in into the ADSB system overview. And to kick that off, I'm going to bring on Jeff Johnson here. Uh, to lead this part of it. And Jeff, um, you've got a tough task ahead of you here, but I invite you to try to introduce us to what the heck this, uh, this ugly acronym really means and what it's all about. All right. Well, I'll give it my best. Thank you, John. And I'm really pleased to be here. Thanks, everyone. Well, we'll go over um, the quick history. We'll go over some terms, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, the uh, 
first off, the history, you know, where did ADSB come from? Uh, there's really, a, we, we started up in, in Alaska. There's a lot more GA uh, activity per capita in Alaska, and, as, and there was also a lot more incidents and accidents. And the question really was raised is some of the current technology that we have that what didn't exist, you know, 50, 75 years ago and some of the, the current systems that are used uh, uh, to surveil aircraft, could those be used today to make the, the uh, GA flying safer? We're talking about things like uh, GPS and, and modern uh, transmitters. So they uh, put together a plan. It was run by an organization called MITRE where they um, developed a new transponder. They sent weather up to these aircraft because that was also a big issue for those of you who've flown in, in Alaska. You know what I'm talking about. And then they transmitted their location to ground and to other airplanes so that they could see what was happening. The answer was, uh, yes, it was a lot better. They actually reduced the incident accident rate and uh, the FAA quickly reached the conclusion that this is something that should be expanded. So where are we now? <clears throat> the uh, the current system was really built on the success of that capstone project and uh, as it says here the final rule came out in 2011 and we've seen uh, a lot of activity since then. There's over 650 ground stations throughout uh, the United States, uh, Puerto Rico, Guam uh, that uh, can see our aircraft through ADSB, and there's lots of options for hardware, and we'll talk about some of those this evening. So let's go to some key terms. Um, first off, uh, these are some of the ones that we'll be going over. We won't be talking about all of them in, in huge detail, but uh, touching on them all. Next gen ADSB, what's this ADSB out and in? Some of the the key transponder options. And then uh, we're talking about some of the, uh, the ADSB in terms as well, and uh, we'll get right into those. So the first thing is, what is what is next gen? Um, next gen is really an umbrella for a number of efforts to modernize the U.S. national airspace, and you see some of them listed here: uh, shorten routes, saving time and fuel, reducing delays, increasing uh, capacity and safety, like we talked about. I guess that last one, John, you threw in. I don't. That, that's probably a stretch goal: the world peace and free beer. Well, it's, it um, seemed like it was the only thing they left off their uh, their, their gold <laughs> list there. So I was helping them out. Very good. Uh, so getting uh, to uh, next gen, the part that we're going to be focused on is really ADSB. It's only one of five major elements, and it's the only one we'll cover tonight. But as you'll find out, there's plenty of depth just in that one term. So what does ADSB stand for? Um, it it uh, just rolls off the tongue, automatic dependent surveillance broadcast. Uh, but when you take it in its parts, it actually does make sense. It's automatic because you don't have to do anything. It's working in the background. Uh, it's dependent on other aircraft being equipped. You see them. When you're equipped, they see you. The ground stations um, pick up your signal, and air traffic control sees you. So that's the dependencies. Uh, surveillance, um, just like radar is today. Today they call that secondary surveillance. Radar the surveillance is saying that this is something they can now use to track your aircraft and broadcast. Once a second your aircraft when you're ADSB equipped is broadcasting its position and its velocity. So as we dig into this term ADSB there's really two major parts to it. There's ADSB out and there's ADSB in. Uh, we should be clear up front in that ADSB out is the only part that is mandated right, for, for a 2020. ADSB in is optional. <clears throat> so ADSB out, uh, it's, we, we use that word surveillance. It's a way to track aircraft. Both you can track other aircraft and ATC and other aircraft can track you. Um, you're reporting your position velocity. And uh, you can see here aircraft that need to be required, excuse me, that will be required to equip uh, will be in classes A, B, C, and above 10,000 feet. The key thing to take from that is not everybody actually has to equip, um, but if you have a mode C transponder today, you probably should equip with ADSB out. Otherwise, you're going to be uh, kept out of airspace that you probably would like to fly in. <clears throat> 
So there's um, ADS-B in and out. ADS-B in is the aircraft's uh, ability to really receive some of the good stuff, the, the free weather and the traffic that we talked about. ADS-B in is optional and as such it is less regulated. What that means is that unlike ADS-B out which requires you to equip your aircraft with fixed equipment. With ADS-B in you have a lot of flexibility. Here you see a Stratus, there's other portables like um, the uh, Garmin GDL39 uh, products from, from Dual and others. And so that's a, and that's a very, very popular uh, thing to equip with today. And in the US we're very fortunate to have this network as I mentioned of 650 towers that are uh, uh, run by the Harris Corporation on behalf of the FAA and uh, that's sending out that we that free weather and uh, traffic information. Free weather is only available in the United States. If you're listening in Canada or other countries, uh, that's uh, something that is not available there. Jumping to the next uh, slide, we can see that uh, ADS-B in the again in the United States, uh, we have two different frequencies, or as they're called, data links. Uh, and we have 978 megahertz and 1090 megahertz, uh, both on ADS-B out and ADS-B in. Uh, in other countries, we have only 1090. The 978 is the reason that we can get weather in the United States because that's that's the um, optional frequency here. So let's talk a little bit about 978 versus 1090. Uh, ADSBN in the U.S. supports these two uh, data links. The 1090, when it's used, is referred to as an extended squitter, and 978 is referred to as a universal access transceiver. I'm not planning on using all those long terms, but if when you sometimes you'll hear people say, "Hey, is that an extended squitter?" They're talking about 1090. If somebody says UAT, they're talking about 978. So let's look at um, uh, 1090 uh, ADSB out or an extended squitter. This use 1090 has actually been used uh, for for decades. It's what's if the frequency that our mode A or mode C, and for those of you that are fortunate to have newer mode S transponders, use. And actually, uh, speaking of mode S transponders, if you have a relatively modern one, something like a Garmin GTX 330ES, um, you can often upgrade that to become an ADSB out transponder if you're able to couple it to a WAS TSO GPS and we're talking about a GPS that's good enough for, for navigation. Uh, it's good to talk to your avionics installer and this isn't the last time I'll mention that in this, uh, this webinar because if you really want to know what is the most economical way to equip it could be taking the transponder you already have and hooking it to a WAS GPS transponder that you may have for example in a navigator. Um, it's also important to note that extended squitter or 1090 um, is the only thing that is acceptable outside the U.S. and in the, when you're in the U.S., if you're above 18,000 feet, it's the only frequency that's allowed. So moving on to the 978 UAT, again, it's sort of the converse of what I just said. This is only allowed in the U.S. and it's only allowed below 18,000 feet. Um, it's also a really key thing to um, understand is if you decide to equip with a 978 megahertz UAT, you still will need to carry at least a, a, a mode C or S transponder. Why might you ask? Well, th there's really two primary reasons. First, the, the uh, radar system that we all enjoy today uh, is dependent on listening to 1090 transponders and so secondary surveillance radar as they call it depends on us having that. Another reason is, is that uh, most uh, uh, large aircraft have a thing called traffic collision avoidance system or TCAS in it where they actually can see you air to air and those two systems secondary surveillance radar and TCAS uh, require and depend on you having a, a 1090 transponder. So if you equip with 978 you'll actually have two of them. <clears throat> so now let's talk about uh, uh, 1090 extended squitter but the, in, the um, inbound part of it, it can detect other aircraft equipped with 1090 transponders or excuse me 1090 uh, transmitters but it, uh, when it's listening for 978 it actually gets rebroadcast that and John is going to talk a little bit more about how the whole uh, TISB or uh, ADSB in works and a uh, 1090 transponder typically cannot receive weather. I say typically, typically because there 
are some newer modern avionics that actually have both 978 and 1090 radios in them so that uh, although they look like a 1090, they can do both. Um, a 978 UATN, just like, because it has that radio, can only hear other aircraft air-to-air -air that are transmitting on that frequency. What is, happens with the uh, folks that only are equipped with an extended squitter 1090? Well, the, tr the, the ground towers fill in that blank for us, and so that that's how that works. 978 receivers are capable of receiving ADSB weather, and so that's one of the popular reasons to consider that option. But as I mentioned earlier, because ADSBN is optional and less regulated, you can use a portable like the Stratus that's shown here. So with all of that, uh, everybody confused? <laughs> well, let's do a little bit of summarizing. Um, for these, these are for ADSB out on the top and ADSB in. Well, let's take the left hand side. 1090 uh, ADSB out works in all altitudes in all countries. Um, and it really to do that, you will replace your transponder. You know, if you have a KT-76 or something like that, it's a mode C that can't be upgraded. You pull it out, you put in a new transponder, your ADSB out compliant. Having said that, if you go down on the left, it will only receive traffic and it doesn't receive weather unless you get one of the, the higher end ones that actually has that second radio in it. On the right hand side, um, we see 978 out. That's only usable below 18,000 feet and only in the U.S. So um, that's typically what's uh, limited to GA piston, although certainly a GA piston aircraft uh, can uh, put in a 1090 extended squitter as well. One of the advantages is once you have that, you do get the 978 uh, inbound traffic and weather, uh, weather in particular. So um, I'm not going to get into these, these next uh, terms because John will be uh, expanding on them, but there's two key things that you'll be listening for, excuse me, that you'll be learning about. These are part of the ADSB in uh, portion. One is called the Flight Information Services Broadcast, or FISB. And this, again, as I referred to earlier, is sort of the good stuff. This is where you get the free weather. Um, you get national and regional radar, METARs, TAFs, PIREPs, and such. And uh, it's it's supported by a broad variety of, of um, remote mounted transponders, 978, as well as a broad spectrum of, of uh, uh, portable transponders. And a lot of folks, I myself included, my primary glass instrument in my 61 Mooney is an iPad looking to the FISB feed coming over a portable. And then jumping to the last uh, portion before John takes over here is uh, TISB. And uh, TISB is the uh, Traffic Information Services Broadcast. It's when those towers are actually sending, uh, rebroadcasting traffic to me. If I'm listening on 978 and it knows I can't hear on 1090, it's going to send that to me. Um, and as John will explain, this is pretty complicated. Uh, unlike weather, it's not just broadcast all the time. And then finally, one um, note here, it's not the same as TIS traffic you may be used to. There's some of the older TIS, or TIS A as I believe it's called, uh, is typically comes from an airport. TIS B is available everywhere in the, in the United States and actually worldwide where they have implemented ADS-B. And so it's a much more flexible program. John, back to you. Thanks, Jeff, very much for walking us through some of those. Uh, with a little bit of that background now in mind, we're going to walk in, you're going to dive into a little bit of the details, a little bit of the nitty gritty. Uh, I promise we will get to the good stuff of how this stuff looks in the real world, but I think it's important to know a little bit more background. So with that in mind, let's dive right into the traffic part. As Jeff alluded to, it gets complicated. Um, as you can see on screen there, weather is, weather is really simple. Weather is like an AM radio. It's broadcast continuously. If you turn on your radio, in this case, a, a Stratus or a GDL 39 or a panel mount receiver, you turn on that radio, you pick up the weather. There's nothing more to do. Traffic is different. Uh, if you want to think of weather as AM radio, you could think of traffic as text messaging. You really only get traffic in response to a transmission. So you have to sort of ask for traffic. Um, now, it's not something you have to manually do as a pilot, but what's happening is, if you are ADSB out equipped, your aircraft sends out that transmission, as Jeff said, every second. That sort of, let's call it, wakes up the ground stations out there. The ground stations will then send back to you a hockey puck of information. This is a, a 30 nautical mile diameter uh, circle that's plus or minus 3,500 feet. You're going to see 
all the aircraft in that hockey puck and that hockey puck is centered on you. Um, so this is a this is great because as Jeff said this fills in the gaps this is not just 1090 or 978 it includes both of those and it includes mode C. So it's a very good traffic picture but again the problem is you have to be ADSB out equipped to get that. Now if you're not ADSB out equipped maybe you're flying close to someone else who is you can sort of sniff that signal and get a part of their uh, of the traffic package but you really don't know what you're missing. So there's one other piece to this and then we're going to put it into, into graphics. We're talking there about ground stations and waking up the ground stations get, and getting that TIS-B broadcast. Well you can also get what we call air-to-air -air traffic and that means that if I've got my portable ADS-B receiver turned on I can receive directly from other aircraft who are ADS-B out equipped. So uh, I don't need any ground stations. If, I, if I'm in a Cessna and there's another aircraft out there that's a Bonanza and it has ADS-B out, I can directly see his transmission. Uh, that doesn't depend on ground stations. Let's put this into graphics and I think it'll make a little more sense. So let's go through three scenarios here. First scenario, we're flying along here in the 172 and we have a Stratus, so we have a portable ADS-B receiver, but we do not have any ADS-B out in our aircraft. What will we see? Well, in this case, there is no ADS-B ground station. So the only traffic we're going to see is that air-to-air -air traffic we just talked about. So in this case, we'll see that Baron up there because he has ADS-B out. We'll see his direct transmission, but we won't see those other two aircraft in red because they don't have ADS-B out and there's no ground station to fill in the gaps. Here's scenario two, a little bit better, where again, we're in a 172, we still don't have ADS-B out and we still have a, a portable ADS-B receiver. But in this case, there is a ground station. So that Baron is flying along and it's waking up that ground station and it's getting that hockey puck of information sent up to it. And so it's seeing all the aircraft in that hockey puck. Well, here we are, we're close to the Baron so we can see his hockey puck of information. And so in addition to the Baron, we also see that other Cessna and he's a mode C target. Well, that's great. We just saw more traffic and we still don't have ADS-B out in our panel. The problem is we don't see that other airplane in red and we don't know that we don't see him. So this is the issue with ADS-B traffic. If you don't have ADS-B out in your panel, you're going to have a limited traffic picture and you just don't know how limited it is. Um, it's one of those situations where you just need to be a little bit paranoid uh, because the traffic is great. If you see traffic, avoid it certainly, but realize you're not getting a complete picture. Here's the perfect scenario. Scenario three, you're flying along with that portable receiver, but now we do have ADS-B out in the panel. Now we're going to be the ones sending down the transmission to the ground station. We're going to get the hockey puck of information centered on our aircraft. So we're going to see all the aircraft within 30 miles and 7,000 feet. Plus we're going to see ADS-B out equipped airplanes air to air. So this is a great scenario. This is uh, really every aircraft you're going to see other than aircraft without a transponder. So it's a nearly complete picture, but it depends on ADS-B out. So here's the key takeaway that is probably obvious by now. Unless you have ADS-B out in your airplane, a panel mounted unit, and you are creating your own customized hockey puck, you're not getting a complete picture of the surrounding traffic. Uh, that, that's about the only absolute with ADS-B traffic. So here's a typical scenario left and right. ADS-B out equipped airplane on the left, you can see a nice picture of traffic on the right. You don't have ADS-B out, so you get some traffic, but certainly not a complete picture. So that's traffic. That's kind of messy, but hopefully that gives you a little background. Now let's talk about the weather part of it, uh, the part that really has been, I think, responsible for a lot of the interest in ADS-B. Uh, because it's weather is something that all pilots deal with pretty much on every flight and ADS-B in gives us a great chance to keep up with that. Um, if you've flown with XM weather or satellite data link products like that, a lot of this is somewhat similar. So we're going to walk through kind of how the ADS-B system works and maybe what some differences are. ADS-B does rely on, as Jeff said, a network of ground stations scattered all across the United States. And sort of like VORs are set up, there are actually four different types of ADS-B ground stations, surface, low, medium, and high. Now this isn't a big deal. In, in practical flying, you're not going to worry about really which one you're getting. In practical flying, you'll be getting five, six, eight, twelve towers at one time, so it doesn't really matter. The only reason I bring this up is there can be some scenarios where, uh, especially say you're on the ground in Florida, maybe there's a ground station 
uh, on the airport. And so you're getting ADSB weather on the ground. Well, that's great. You may only be getting that surface station though. And so you may look at your EFB app and you may see that you only have radar for about 150 nautical miles. And you may think, well, what's wrong? I don't, I need nationwide radar. Well, the issue there is you're only getting that surface station. And that surface station only transmits 150 nautical mile regional next red radar. Once you get up to altitude and get more stations, when you get one of those uh, medium or high altitude stations, you'll be getting continental US radar. That's that CONUS part. Um, so it'll fill in the gap. So again, everyday flying, not a big deal, but understand that there are actually different types of uh, ground stations out there that transmit slightly different information. How about timing? Uh, as a data link product, certainly ADSB weather is not real time. No uh, data link product is real time, but it's pretty darn good. It's pretty uh, similar to XM. If you've flown with that, you're looking at regional radar. So uh, that, that radar within about 150 to 250 nautical miles of you, you'll get that every five minutes. Uh, they transmit it every two and a half minutes, but the actual picture is updated every five minutes. That longer range CONUS or continental US radar is updated every 15 minutes. Uh, METARs, NOTAMs, things like that, five to 10 minutes. So you're pretty typical update rate. One thing I'll point out here though, that trips up a few people on METARs. Most airports only update their METARs every hour. So while the METAR feed is sent out every five minutes over ADSB, it can only send out what it receives. And if your airport only updates the ATIS, say every hour, maybe five minutes till the hour, that's all you're going to get. So if you see a 45 minute old METAR, that doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong. It probably just means the airport hasn't updated the ATIS uh, and you'll have a new one close to the top of the hour. So how about a ADSB versus XM? Again, a lot of folks have been, have flown with XM weather over the years. They're very, very similar um, in terms of the key things you're really looking for. Radar, METARs, TAFs, PIRAPs, those are sort of the essentials to me. TFRs are another one. Um, but there are some differences. One of the things you'll see is there is no satellite imagery on ADSB. There is on XM. Um, the radar is a little bit lower resolution on ADSB, as you'll see here in a second. Um, but really the biggest piece probably at the bottom for many people is that ADSB is free, subscription free. Your tax dollars paid for it. Uh, and an XM subscription is somewhere between about 35 and 55 a month. So how about that radar? What's the difference? Well, here's uh, the same system, uh, three screenshots in four flight here. XM on the left, ADSB national, that CONUS product in the middle and then ADSB regional on the right. You can see that XM picture is really nice, nice and high, high definition, smooth contours. And you may look at the middle one in ADSB and say, ew, that's not great. That's kind of blocky. That looks sort of 1980s. Um, and it certainly is blockier. But if you go over to the right in that regional, and again, that's what you'll have within about 200 miles of your airplane. That's a lot higher resolution, not as good as the XM maybe. Um, but here's a scenario I'd say if that ADSB was in 4K high definition, would anybody fly through that line? Uh, you know, practically speaking, I can tell you from my five years of experience flying with ADSB and XM, there's really not a practical difference. Um, you know, take a look at even that ADSB national picture in the middle. Nobody's going to fly through that line no matter what, even with that blocky picture. So uh, there is a difference, certainly one to understand, but I think practically you'll find that uh, the ADSB radar is giving you the same basic information. The one other key difference with ADSB and XM is that ADSB is ground based. So you're not going to get it on the ground most places. You need to get to altitude uh, to get coverage. The good news there is that the initial build out of the ADSB system is complete. So coverage has really become quite good. Uh, here's an FAA estimate of coverage at 1500 feet AGL. You can see east of the Mississippi, it's really quite good. And I can tell you at uh, Sporties, just east of Cincinnati, Ohio, we get ADSB about 200 feet after takeoff, and we're about 40 miles from the closest station. Um, so not bad. Now you get up to 5,000 feet, maybe a, a fairly typical uh, cruise altitude in flight for a cross country. You can see the coverage is pretty much universal, uh, all but the most remote parts of uh, you know Nevada and Montana. Uh, coverage is really quite good. All right, so with that, big background in mind and a lot of terms and a lot of technology. Hopefully you understand some of the theory and uh, some of the technology behind the scenes. What we're going to do now is put this into action and really look at how this works in the real world. And we're going to start out with Panamount ADSB uh, solutions. And for that, I'm going to bring back Jeff. Thanks, John. 
Well, first we're going to go after a few, we're going to talk about a few facts uh, that will give us a little more background before we actually look at specific transponder options. And uh, bear with me, we will get to them, so we'll give you some real feedback on, on options and pricing. Here's five facts that it's good to think about uh, when approaching this topic. Uh, and, and I touched on this earlier, but if you have a, if you need a mode C transponder t today, you know, you're flying near mode C veils, you're above 10,000 feet, you're going in class B or C airplanes, or excuse me, airports, you're going to need uh, ADSB outcome 2020. The next one is that a WAS GPS is included in your install. And to expand on that, it actually needs to be a TSO'd WAS GPS if it's to be used in a certified aircraft. If it's an experimental, the rules are a little more interesting. There you just need to have a GPS that meets what they call the minimum operational performance standards or MOPs. So if you have a, a, a Dynon Skyview system with a, with a transponder, they have a, a, a GPS WAS um, and receiver that meets the minimum, that meets the MOPs and you can use with that system. Uh, ADSB out compliance uh, is a permanently installed product that uh, is something that is a lot of confusion. We get that question a lot. We actually re-ask the FAA from time to time because you, uh, you could be misled by some marketing out there, but it is a permanently mounted device. Uh, ADSBN, as we mentioned, is, is, is the optional. And as a result of that, you, it's much more flexible. That's where you do see portables. And uh, that's well worth doing for some of the reasons that you just saw with John. All the weather and, and things like that are coming on in and traffic as well. And then uh, regardless of uh, how you equip, remember that you still need your mode C transponder or mode S transponder is, is suitable as well if you, tend, if you uh, equip with 978 ADSB out. So um, here's a, a picture of what we talked about earlier above 18,000 feet. Um, there you have to have uh, 1090 only, uh, class C and B airspace and above, you have to have ADSB, and in mode C veils, you have to have some type of ADSB and above 10,000 feet. So what about experimental aircraft? I touched on their GPS receivers. Um, the uh, again, these MOPs apply. You can re you can use non-TSO ADSB avionics, but you need to make sure that they do meet the performance standards of ADSB out. And for that, you just need to talk to your your manufacturer, and they need to have that on file. For the uh, special light sport aircraft, uh, it's a little more uh, restrictive because there the aircraft OEM really controls the avionics. And so before you make a selection there, you should talk to your, your aircraft OEM and ask them what options are suitable and available to you. You may find that it, uh, it's a little more restrictive than uh, you had first thought or hoped for. And the same is true for glass cockpits because oftentimes there the transponder is built right into the type certificate. So uh, I mentioned portables. Um, technically, it's actually feasible, but uh, I wouldn't count on doing it, particularly in a certified aircraft. Um, the, the question here that's posed is, would you use an IFR, would you use a portable for an IFR approach? Well, if it's the only thing you have in your aircraft because everything else has failed, sure. But that's not your first choice, and it shouldn't be the case also with ADSB out. And here we have a quote from uh, the link you see at the bottom of the screen from the FAA indicating that despite what you might see from marketing, uh, it's not something that is okay to do. The FA prohibits their use. That's a pretty direct statement. So um, before we, we jump into a few op the options, let's go over a couple final facts here. Uh, here's a summary of the difference between 978 and 1090. Typically 978, you'll see some of the very low end options cost uh, that will cost less than your 1090. But I mentioned earlier, you need to talk to your avionics installer. Here's a key area to do so because the cost to install a 978, which is typically one of these remote boxes, not a panel mount, is, is, uh, is more. Uh, our piston singles are designed to have the avionics in the uh, instrument panel. We don't have a avionics bay like you'd have in a twin and in larger aircraft. And so that's something to really bear in mind. So talk to your avionics installer, maybe get a, a quote on both and see what you like best. Uh, 1090, as you can see, also is approved for more 
airspace above 18,000 feet may apply to you uh, outside. If you do, you fly in Canada occasionally a lot. Uh, that's that's a big factor there. Um, and then the and the next one is a little bit of a. Um, well, I think it's something that's less obvious, but when you think about it, it's kind of a neat option. You you get to upgrade your transponder if you have an old. Um, mode C transponder uh, that has let's say like the you know the dials on the front how it's a good time to get a new digital uh, modern transponder and I'll give you a few other tips on that a little bit later uh, sometimes the 978 because you have both of the transponders in there you have a control head and that's something that um, is is an issue as well so questions to consider, uh, the age of your transponder. As I mentioned, we have to, if you put in a 978, you have to leave your old one in there. Um, that, that may have some problems for you, and I'll give you a tip on that at the, at the end after we look at all the options. Uh, ask about that installation cost, um, and then, as we mentioned, 978, usually a little more expensive to, to install than 1090 because of that. Uh, there's really no natural place to put that. That last part is a is a reference. Once you do uh, get installed, we, some of the earlier installs. Um, what I mean by earlier, a couple of years ago when the system was new, we saw a lot of of situations where things were not wired right. I think now the avionics community is quite up to speed on this. But uh, once you get done, you can email uh, that address down there and say, "Hey, here's my tail number. How do I look?" And uh, they'll send you a surface and say, "You're looking great." Also, ForeFlight has owner, that own chip in there. So now let's get into the good stuff. Let's talk about actual ways that you can equip with ADS-B out. Um, starting with Garmin, um, the, uh, this is a 1090 uh, extended squitter out transponder. This replaces, say, if you have a KT-76, it's the same, um, the same size avionic, uh, and they have... Uh, both a panel and remote mount. Uh, the remote mount here is really um, only used, or mostly used, I don't know if the word only applies to if you have something like a G1000, a glass panel, where you actually don't have uh, a visible transponder on your, your instrument panel. In that case, the remote is used. But for the most part, uh, the GTX 335 and 345 is a panel mount. The 345 uh, is the more expensive of the two, but it has an, a unique feature in that they've also incorporated ADS-B in and has an integrated flight stream. The flight stream is the Bluetooth radio that Garmin has that can talk to Garmin Pilot and, and uh, ForeFlight so that you can send weather to an iPad. Price range for the, uh, the systems that have a built-in GPS, there you see 37.95 and then 57.95. That 57.95 is the one that has the dual radios in it. Uh, they also have uh, options that don't include the GPS. Let's say you have one in your, uh, you have a GNS 430W or something like that. Uh, your avionics installer can use that GPS source, and there you can shave um, a little less than a thousand dollars off the base price. So jumping to our, our next option, uh, this is another one of these ones that has an all-in-one box. It's uh, made by, by L3. They have a wide family of avionics, both panel mount and remote mount. The remote mounts tend to be 978, so we'll talk about those separately. But uh, this is a, um, a model that has got a lot of attention because they actually have a display, as you can see there, that shows some of the inbound products that John was showing you on a on a on a tablet. Typically with ADS-B in you view it on an iPad or on your multifunction display on a moving map. Well with L3 they've, they've put that right on the transponders uh, uh, face and it, it's a pretty striking looking product. I've, I've uh, looked at it. Their pricing is a little on the higher side because of that additional functionality but uh, for some of you that may be, may be worth it. The other thing because there's a, a larger display there it is slightly taller than a standard transponder so if you're pulling out a KT-76 and want to put this in, you might have to have some things moved around and you'll want to talk to your avionics installer about that. Next one is uh, one from the company I work at called the Stratus ESG. Uh, it, like the other options, is an all-in-one ADS-B out in that it's a 1090 extended squitter with a uh, built-in GPS. Uh, this one is, is uh, has a 
a unique feature in that if you own a Stratus portable, even a GDL39 or something, uh, another another portable, it has an optional connection kit to where you can take the antennas outside of your aircraft and connect it to your portable so you can really get um, a great reception. Um, this product is uh, something that uh, we will be shipping in just a couple weeks experimental and hopefully a couple weeks after that uh, in in certified fashion. We're in our, our home stretch on it. We're pretty excited about it. Now let's jump to um, 978 uh, boxes. These are universally remote uh, mounted boxes. And uh, here you start with the Garmin. Garmin has two families, the GDL88 and the GDL84. The GDL88 was the uh, is the older of the two. Uh, they have um, ones that are out or in or out, or, um, in and out, excuse me, with or without GPS, a lot of options. And uh, it works um, to show traffic and weather on Garmin um, multifunction displays. It also will connect with the uh, flight streams and can be sending some of that data out to, to tablets as well. Uh, here you see the pricing range from $39.95 to $57.90. Now to the uh, the newer of the Garmin uh, remote 978s, uh, we have the GDL84. What's the main the main difference? It includes this flight stream Bluetooth radio, uh, and so that you don't need to have that extra part. Uh, and there you see the price range for it, but very similar functionality to the GDL88. Uh, Free flight, uh, they've been uh, in the market for a long time with their, their Ranger. Uh, series of ADSB receivers. Uh, this is a 978. Uh, they have, I think, the the prize of having the lowest price transponder at 1995. Again, remember that uh, installation and system cost is your key, but it is certainly an attractive option to look at. They also have models that include an internal GPS or without it. Uh, the, the note here about requiring a separate control head is interesting. With Garmin, Garmin has a patent on the ability to listen to your older transponder and synchronize the squawk code. Uh, because that's patented, other manufacturers have to find other ways and in the, of, of keeping those two squawk codes synchronized between your UAT and your older transponder. In the case of the Free, free Flight Ranger line, uh, there is a uh, control head that you can get. Then jumping to the Lynx product, uh, this also is um, a 978 remote box, and they have both with and without GPS, and there you see their, their price range. So that's um, the avionics. The question is, what are your fellow pilots doing? What, what is getting traction? And uh, we actually were pretty surprised when we saw this data. This slide on the left is a little dated. It stops at August 15th, but I have some newer data on the right. Uh, and you can see that uh, panel-mounted uh, 1090 extended squitters are being installed at close to, not quite, but close to three times the rate as remote UATs. And if you look on the, I, I reached out to the FAA earlier this week and they sent me their latest statistics, which are as of March 1st, 2016, you'll see that that's about the same, if not have ticked up maybe one more percent. So that is uh, staying the same. You'll see that uh, U.S. General Aviation, I think most of the people on the line here are the ones who are adopting in the, in the largest numbers. And uh, there's some of the other uh, folks that are lagging a little bit behind. But this was a surprising trend, but I think it's useful to know. So question would be, why? Why is 1090 extended squitter trending? Well, um, if you go to uh, Apario's blog, there's a video I posted about a personal experience that, that uh, led to us developing a panel mount. For me, it was because my old transponder failed and uh, when I was on an IFR flight, and I found out later on that if your aircraft was built before 1995, it tends to, it, it's most likely it has a tube in it in its amplifier chain. And for those of us old enough to remember tube-based televisions and radios, those things failed a lot and they can fail in your aircraft. It's the most common source of failure. So that's one reason to consider putting in a new panel mount transponder because you can move up to a digital one. Um, the other, the next one uh, is it gives your instrument panel a visible upgrade. It's something where, you know, you're put, you have to put that money down to become uh, 2020 compliant. Why not uh, get a nice new uh, panel upgrade? And then the, th the third thing is, and I've been harping on this, uh, talk to your avionics installer about the install time because piston singles are designed to have their avionics in the, in the instrument panel, oftentimes a panel mount avionic can take up to half the time to install, and that's 
definitely something to factor into the overall economics. So the question I know a lot of you are asking yourself is, gee, it seems like every time I turn around there's, there's new options. Uh, is it time to equip now? Well, um, that's, that's a personal decision for each and every one of you, but I can tell you there's a lot of options out there. And uh, as you can see from this quote from Vertical Magazine, they're saying, you know, why wait? You know, you get so much benefit out of the extra traffic uh, assurance that John was showing you. Uh, it really makes a lot of sense. So even if you're portable, if you're getting your ADSB in on a portable, it's a good thing to uh, to do. It's well worth it. And then, as mentioned, with my personal experience, where you have something that breaks, that if you do have a mode C transponder that breaks, it's a great time to replace it um, with a with a new upgrade. And that's all I have, John. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Great overview on the panel side of things. Uh, that's where a lot of the interest has been lately. We're going to spend just a few minutes here on the portable options and then try to close with just a few tips for you um, as we get into the portable. So portables up until, well, really still today, but uh, especially early on, portables were um, getting a lot of the attention. Uh, they have, have outsold uh, installed ADSB by a huge number. A lot of reasons for that. One is that you really get a lot of the benefits of ADSB uh, for less money. The iPad and tablets have really been the game changer there because finally there's an easy portable way to display that information. Uh, portable ADSB is also great if you're in a, a renter in a flying club where you probably don't control the avionics in the panel of the aircraft you fly. Uh, just a reminder, portable devices are ADSB in only not out, but there are lots of, lots of options to choose from uh, that can really make your app even more powerful. Uh, and so when we talk about apps, let's do another quick poll here. Uh, I'm going to launch it here. Just tell us what app you're flying with most often right now. We've got Garmin Pilot, ForeFlight, Wing X, Pro7, FlightPlan.com's Go app, or another one, say uh, FlyQ or Jeppesen or something like that. Votes coming in here, and looks like uh, ForeFlight so far is the early leader. Most folks flying with that. I've got a few folks flying with Garmin Pilot. I'll uh, give it just one more second here to close up the poll if you haven't voted. And we'll move on here. Thanks for the voting. Um, so the reason we ask about apps here is that, you know, the apps to a certain extent are going to dictate, uh, you know, what you want to fly with from a portable standpoint. And we're going to go over some of the options here. First up is Sky Radar. Sky Radar has been in the portable um, ADSB market probably longer than anybody. They were one of the first to do it. They have two products, the D and the DX. These do ADSB weather and GPS, dual band traffic, and they have a higher end model that has an AHARS in it. $699 and $849 for the higher end model. A lot of these features and prices are going to be pretty similar. You'll see pretty competitive across the board here. Uh, next up, iLevel. Uh, they really grew up doing AHARs, so that's sort of their specialty, but they have two models, the SW and AW. They do ADSB weather and GPS, single band traffic, meaning they receive that 978 frequency, uh, but not that 1090 frequency. They have built-in AHARs, uh, work with a variety of apps. One interesting thing on that SW, it has a solar panel. It doesn't necessarily recharge the battery, but it does extend the battery life a little bit if you put it up on the panel. Uh, $1,195 for the SW, $1,395 for the AW, and that's actually a good option for home builders because that adds a pedostatic input. So if you want to kind of build it in as almost your, your primary built-in system, you can do that. Dual electronics, makers of a very popular GPS, that little red circle uh, device that uh, lots of pilots fly with. They also have an ADSB product. Uh, this one is ADSB weather and GPS. Uh, dual band traffic, it has an AHARS, has a built in battery. Again, works with Wing X and FlyQ and Flight Plan, and it's 850. Garmin, very, very uh, active in the panel installed ADSB market, also very active in the portable market. They have a, a family of products called GDL39. These do ADSB weather and GPS dual band traffic. The GDL39 3D model, or three dimensional if you want to think of it that way, adds AHARS. It comes without a battery, but you can add one on as an option. These work with the Garmin Pilot app, but one of the other neat things here is it can work with Garmin portable GPSs. So if you had an ERA 796, say, you could uh, connect a GDL39 to an ERA 796 and an iPad at the same time, which is a nice feature. And then Stratus from Apario. 1S and 2S are the latest models. Again, ADSB weather and GPS like all of these. 
The 1S is a single band model for traffic. The 2S is dual band, so a little bit more complete traffic picture. The 2S also adds AHARs. has a really long battery in there, an 8-hour battery built in, so no wires or antennas external. And Stratus is made for 4 flight, 549 for the 1S, 899 for the 2S. There's one other option that's come out there recently, and this is more of a do-it-yourself version. This is called Stratix, and uh, you can buy parts using the Raspberry Pi uh, sort of uh, uh, maker movement uh, computer. Uh, you can, for about $150, buy the parts and build this yourself. It gives you ADS-B weather and GPS and traffic. Um, no AHARS option yet, and there's no battery built in, although you can connect it certainly to a portable one. So, uh, you know, if you're kind of a tinkerer, maybe you're a home builder, you like uh, working with electronics, this is a good option. If you're somebody who's more interested in uh, taking it out of the box and flying, this, is, this may be more work than, than you want to do. So how to choose one. Like Jeff said, there's all these options in ADS-B out, and you have to go through this sort of series of questions. Same thing with portable. How do you choose the right one? Well, I think the first step is to think of an app. You know, we, we all fly with apps and we all have our own preferences. This is sort of a Coke and Pepsi thing. Uh, you know, if you like Garmin Pilot, then you should fly with Garmin Pilot. If you like ForeFlight, you should fly with ForeFlight. It's really a matter of what makes sense to you and what you know how to operate. So I would say don't chase hardware around. Pick the app that you like and then find the hardware that works with it. If you fly with ForeFlight, that means Stratus. Garmin, that means GDL39. Wing X, that means Sky Radar, the dual or eye level. Flight Plan Go, that means the dual or the eye level. Some other things to think about, though, it's not just the app. Um, number one, something not to worry about is reception. In all the testing I've done flying with really all of these units, reception is comparable. Uh, there'll be some differences here and there, but that coverage is so good now with that ADS-B network that I wouldn't worry about reception. It's just not uh, a factor that matters. Do you think about battery life? Uh, if you're going to build it in maybe and hardwire it, battery life may not matter at all to you. On the other hand, if you're a renter or in a flying club and you're always going to be bringing it with you, battery life may be really, really important. So consider that, whether that's something you want to have. Decide if traffic is an important factor. Uh, if you have, one important thing to note here is if you have ADS-B uh, out already in your panel, you don't necessarily need that dual band. Uh, that single band is, is all you need. So you may not have to worry about that. If you don't have ADS-B out, dual band will fill in a few gaps for you, uh, give you a little bit more complete picture, although certainly not everything. Uh, if you fly IFR, I think AHARS is a really nice backup. Uh, that backup attitude, it's certainly not primary, but it's a nice backup if you need it. So consider that. And then that one last note there, all these receivers include a GPS. So uh, all of these are an all-in-one solution. You don't have to buy uh, a Stratus and a dual GPS, for example. Uh, a Stratus or a GDL39 or a dual 190, these all include a GPS as well. So given the market, let's put that in action and just look at what this looks like in the cockpit as we fly with it and look at some of the results of ADS-B in a portable. So in this example, we'll fly with four flight and Stratus since it looks like most of you are flying with four flight. We just uh, turn on Stratus, connect it to our iPad, and then fire up four flight. It's just going to be another weather source for four flight. Uh, so the, the way you use four flight really doesn't change. Go into the maps page, turn on a map overlay. You can look at radar, TFRs, flight rules, pi reps, whatever it might be. One nice thing to do is to use different chart layers. Um, you know, some of us get stuck on just always looking at sectionals or low root charts, but you can overlay it on different sectionals or on different charts. One thing that's nice that I do from time to time is that world map on the far right. It, it just gives it a little more uh, contrast. So if you're trying to really get a view of what a complex uh, system looks like on radar, try that world map view. METARs and TAFs can be viewed uh, in their raw code or decoded in plain English. But one of the other nice features is this visual map view. And I don't think enough pilots use this feature. Uh, a lot of us, especially if we learn to fly, you know, 15, 20, 30, 50 years ago, um, you know, we're used to reading those coded reports. And that's fine. But these apps now do a really good job of displaying a big picture view. So in this example in ForeFlight, I've got visibility turned on. And I can see all those tens are for 10 miles visibility, but they're also color coded. So I can get a really good at a glance view of where's the good visibility, where's the bad visibility. It goes from that green to that blue five and three as it gets marginal, and then down to that red two when it's IFR, and it'll go pink when it's low IFR. That helps you get a really good at a glance look at what are the weather conditions. Is it, is it just an isolated thing that this one airport down in the valley has fog, or is there really widespread weather out there that I need to be aware of? So 
it's fine to read the uh, the, the METARs and TAFs and text, no doubt, but don't be afraid to turn on a layer there and get a more visual look at it. Here's the view in the airports page in ForeFlight if you did want to read uh, the raw text, that's another place to find it. TFRs unfortunately are a fact of life and those are transmitted by ADSB. so Make sure you turn those on. You can tap on a TFR for more information, including altitude and effective times. Wouldn't hurt to confirm this with ATC or with flight service if you want to, but this is really helpful for flight planning and for, uh, for staying legal. Airmats and SIGMATS is another one that I think is pretty useful on ADSB. And, and Airmats and SIGMATS are sometimes a waste. If you've ever been on a frequency with ATC and you'll hear them come on and say, well, we've got a new uh, convective SIGMAT from 30 miles southeast of nowhere to 40 miles southwest of nowhere to 20 miles north of nowhere. I've always thought it's kind of use, useless because you don't really know what the heck they're talking about. I can't draw that map in my head. Um, but when you can display it here uh, on your iPad visually and on top of that, see your position in your route, it really adds a lot more value to it. So uh, AirMets and SIGMets, I think, are, are very useful here. Again, tap on them for more information, especially altitudes. Here we've got a uh, AirMet for turbulence, but who cares because it starts at 27,000 feet and we're never going to get there in our 182 today. Pilot reports is another example of something that has always been helpful, but I think when it's put in context is even more helpful. So here we have a pilot report, but we have it overlaid on a radar, overlaid on a map with our position and our route. All that information and context really makes a difference. And I'll give you one example here. A few years ago, I was flying back from Sun and Fun, the end of a long week, and uh, on the frequency, we hear a pilot come on and report severe turbulence. If you've ever heard that re report on frequency, you know that it's really unnerving. You know, there's no matter how many hours you've got, severe turbulence is no fun at all. It's a bad deal. So we were kind of, uh, you know, alert to that, wondering what that might be like. We had passengers in the back, um, so we're kind of nervous about that. Well, about two minutes later, the PIRAP popped up on ForeFlight, and it was right in the middle of a bright red cell of a nasty line of thunderstorms. So not a big surprise. This guy had severe turbulence because, unfortunately, he'd flown into a thunderstorm. Uh, that kind of put us at ease. We flew home and really never had a bump. So it's an example of how a PIREP isn't always bad news. Sometimes it can be good news, but you have to have that in context to kind of understand why that might be. Winds aloft are also transmitted. Um, these are the forecast winds aloft. You can tap on an airport, and uh, this is where you could read the METAR TAF, or you see the winds option down there for all the different altitudes. NOTAMs are also transmitted uh, on ADSB. You can find that in the airports tab. Traffic we've talked a lot about uh, tonight, but here's an example of a traffic uh, uh, overlay. Again, like most things in ForeFlight, uh, if you want more information, just tap on a target. You can see its heading and its speed in this case, and even its end number uh, because it's ADSB out equipped. Reminder that all these include GPS, so all of your um, you know, track up navigation, your terrain warning systems, all those things can be driven from an ADSB receiver. And then finally, the AHARS piece or attitude heading reference system that drives that backup attitude indicator that can be a really valuable backup. Here it is in ForeFlight as a split screen. We have the attitude next to the map, or you can add the synthetic vision feature with the Basic Plus or Pro Plus subscription uh, that really brings it alive. You know, I thought this was kind of a gimmick at first, but I have to say the more I've flown with it, the more I really see the value here. Uh, even VFR, it's great for situational awareness. It's great for finding a, an airport on a hazy day. Uh, it's great for having an awareness of obstacles and terrain. So synthetic vision with that AHARS from, uh, from uh, Stratus is a really complete situational awareness tool. So we have just a few minutes left. I just want to close with a few tips for you that if you do fly with, uh, if, with ADS-B in the cockpit, a couple of things to use it to its, its most uh, advantage. Number one, anytime we're talking about a portable receiver, location matters. Um, take some, find, some time to find the right spot in your airplane. You're trying to balance really four things. You're looking down to the ground for ADS-B signals, up to the sky for GPS. You want to keep it relatively steady for that AHARS. It doesn't have to be level. You'll notice one of those screens there, the, the Stratus is mounted on its side, so it doesn't have to be level. You can calibrate for that. It just needs to be steady. And then you want to keep it out of direct sunlight if you can. Uh, you know, most of these units are pretty good about operating in, in high heat environments, but like anything, especially if it has a battery in it, uh, if you can avoid cooking it in direct sun, that's probably a good idea. 
If you do have reception issues, which again are pretty rare these days, uh, there are external antenna options you can use. Um, and again, don't worry about the whole high versus low towers. That's not something that really impacts you day to day. You'll get lots of towers. One thing though you should make a regular habit out of is to check status. Make it a habit to, a habit to continually check the status of your ADSB system. Uh, most apps make it really easy to do this. Uh, in this example, we have four flight on the maps page. You can tap that gear symbol at the top left and go to the strata status page. This page has all kinds of information, battery life, the age of the weather, how many towers you're getting, your GPS performance. There's all kinds of great information there. So uh, you don't have to thoroughly digest all that every five minutes, but make it a habit once in a while to, to check that status. Make sure you're getting current weather. Make sure everything's correct. And if you find something that's not working correctly, take a screenshot of that strata status menu because that makes it really easy to troubleshoot. You can screenshot that, email it to support once you land, uh, and the person on the other end will then have a really good idea of what you were seeing in the air. Jeff mentioned earlier checking the status of your ADSB out if you have ADSB out in your panel. There's a really cool feature in ForeFlight that lets you do that. Uh, ForeFlight listens for your own ADSB out transmission. And again, from the Strata status menu, you can tap on that own ship ADSB out and get a pretty comprehensive report of what you're sending out. If you scroll down to the bottom of that, you'll see a bunch of numbers and letters, and you don't have to understand them, but green is good and red is bad. Um, and so it's, a, again, a great way. Screenshot that, send it to your avionics shop maybe. Say, hey, is, this, is everything looking good? Is this set up the way it should be? Uh, it's a great way to just do a quick self-check. You can show ADSB ground stations in most apps. I, I don't necessarily think you need to all the time, but if maybe you're flying in an area of marginal coverage, it's something to consider. You can turn on those ground stations and see where they are, see if you're going to fly out of coverage maybe. You can connect to multiple devices. Uh, almost every ADSB receiver out there allows you to connect to at least two, and in some cases five or six devices at the same time. So if you want to have a, an iPad and an iPhone as a backup, or an iPad and a co-pilot's iPad at the same time, you can do that. I really like the measure tool. You can find this on a lot of apps. Uh, here it is in ForeFlight. Tap two fingers on the screen at the same time, and it'll measure the distance between those two points that you tapped. It'll also give you the current time en route for uh, at your current ground speed. This is really useful for all kinds of things, but with weather, I like it because it's a way to find out how far am I from my nearest VFR alternate, uh, how, how thick is that line of weather up there, how long might we be in rain. Uh, there's all kinds of uses for it, so use that measure tool. Tap two fingers on the screen at the same time. And then probably my favorite tool with ADSB weather is the rubber band flight planning. Uh, here's an example where I had a flight from Cincinnati area to Chicago, and there's a big, ugly-looking thunderstorm cell in the way. Well, there's no point in flying up to that and asking ATC for 20 degrees right and 20 degrees left and trying to deviate all around it. Just tap on your course line, hold, and drag your course line clear of the weather, and then change your flight plan. So in this case, I just called up Indy Center and said, hey, we'd like to change our flight plan to uh, Brickyard, then direct destination. That will keep us well clear of the weather. He can type that in his computer and let everybody down the road know that that's our plan instead of having to constantly refine 20 degrees left, 20 degrees right. So again, ADSB weather as a strategic weather planning tool is not a way to pick through tightly embedded thunderstorms. It's a way to make a plan 100 miles down the road before you even get up close to the weather. Um, and if, you, if it's used that way, it's really, really valuable. Remember that delay. Again, it's data link, so it's not real time. Um, and almost all apps have a timestamp where you can monitor the age of that weather. Here in ForeFlight, it'll turn yellow or red if it gets too old. Well, that's your hint that you need to go look at that strata status symbol and make sure that everything is correct. So it's not real time. It's, it's pretty close and it's quite good, but remember that delay. It's not real time. And most importantly, I'm going to close with this. It's so obvious, but it's so important. Use your eyeballs. Uh, it's the most powerful weather instrument in any cockpit is the Mark I eyeball. Uh, and, and sometimes I think we can back ourselves into a corner and say, well, well, the, you know, the, the iPad shows there's no rain out there. The radar is clear. And I've had this myself even. Here's an example. That cell on the left, which has towering tops above 40,000 feet, was not showing up on radar yet. But would anybody actually fly through that? No way. I mean, you're going to get a terrible ride going through that. Uh, but it's almost, it, it can, if you're not careful, you can lull yourself into thinking, well, the, you know, the radar isn't showing it up, so it must be okay. That's not the way it works. 
the data link weather like ADSB is a really great tool. I wouldn't fly without it, but it only gets one vote. And your eyes get another vote and a veto on top of that. So use it as a tool. Use ADSB as a tool to inform your decision making, but don't ever let it make you a slave uh, to that technology. Make sure if that cloud looks ugly, regardless of the radar, don't fly through it. With that, we're going to pause and uh, just before we wrap up, answer a few questions. You can see our email address is there on the screen. If you have questions afterwards, feel free to, to mention those to us. Um, and as we go to the questions here, um, we're going to answer a couple here on a couple different topics. And Jeff, I want to throw this first one to you. Um, got a question here. It says, if I'm installing a dual band uh, transponder, is a mode C not required? So maybe, you know, if I'm installing one of those, um, uh, say, let's take the example of a GDL84 that's 978 out, but 1090 and 978 in. Um, well, that's single band out, but dual band in. So help me there. Do I need a transponder or not? In that case, you do, John, because the, nine, the, the key was when you said 978 out, you always have to have a 1090 out transmitter in your aircraft, and that's going to be a mode C or S uh, transponder or, or extended squitter. Um, there are other dual band transceivers, for example, the, uh, the GTX 345 or the Lynx um, series where you have both radios, but you do have a 1090 out. And in that case, you can get by with just installing the one avionic. So the key is uh, if you're putting in a dual band, but it's 978 out, you still have to have, you still have to leave your old transponder in. Okay, great. Here's a question we have, uh, says, says I have ADSB out. I seldom see traffic between Reno and Las Vegas, but get great traffic coverage other places. Why? Well, that case, um, what I would suspect, Jeff, and, and jump in if you disagree, um, there may be limited ADSB coverage there. So if you have ADSB out, you know, you're waking up the ground stations, but those ground stations have to be there to wake up. And that may just be an area where ground uh, station coverage is limited. So you could certainly check in your app and if and see how many towers you're receiving. The other thing there is there may be limited ground radar. So it gets complicated here, but in order to see traffic um, that's not ADSB out equipped, air traffic control first has to paint that target with the radar and then transmit it up through an ADSB ground station. So it could be you're in an area there and that's a pretty remote area there. It could be that there's not ground radar to light up that target in the first place. So even if you're receiving a ground station, um, you know, again, there's no radar there that has that has painted that target to send it up to you. I, I would add to that, John, that if you if you are seeing that that picture, but you know there's other aircraft out there, and you're you know you're near larger airports where there are there is um, radar, I would check with my avionics installer because they have some settings that they set in your transponder that says, for example, hey, I'm I'm sending out on 1090, but I'm listening on 978. They actually have to tell the ground station what inbound radios you have and if that isn't set up correctly and I've talked to a number of people where that wasn't set up correctly uh, they may not be getting the rebroadcasting that they think they should so that's something to think about as well. Good point Jeff thank you. Here's one for you Jeff says what will be the recurrent maintenance requirements uh, if, after I put an ADSB out so is it like a transponder do I need a 24 month check or how does that work? If it is a transponder, meaning it's 1090, yes, you need the 24 hour, the 24 month uh, transponder check. With 978, I don't believe that's the case, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, and I've got one uh, last question as we close up here. Um, and it says, will ADSB in or out become a worldwide ICAO requirement in the near future? And I know, Jeff, that it's, it's hard for you to predict the future worldwide, but uh, what's your guess in terms of outside the U.S.? What are the trends going to be for ADSB mandates? Yeah, 1090 ADSB out uh, is in the process of being adopted pretty much worldwide. And even those countries where uh, you know, you, where they're not going to be building ground station infrastructure like we have here in the U.S. and Canada and some in, in Europe. Um, they are using space-based solutions to see that. The newest Iridium satellites actually have ADSB receivers in them. So you're seeing some of the African countries and such um, start listening for ADSB through uh, through uh, basically satellites. So it's a worldwide 
thing for ADSB out. ADSB in, uh, where we're getting free weather, again, only the US right now. I'm not aware of any other country that's either building or contemplating that, but sending ADSB traffic up, that also is going to be a worldwide thing. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for joining us tonight for all your help. Thanks to everyone out there who uh, joined us on this webinar. We appreciate your participation and your questions. Again, look for a recording of this webinar in a few days if you missed something, and uh, feel free to check out the Sporties website or, or iPad Pilot News for more information. Uh, and I'll, I'll echo what Jeff said. The Apario blog has an interesting video talking about ADSB and and what an upgrade really can mean beyond just the mandate. So thanks for joining us again. I hope to see you again on another Sporties webinar soon, and I wish you a very good evening.